um, unlike many other areas of theory um, and academia, the area of lifelong learning is uh, and should be very accessible to um, all of us and without the need for academic jargon or over complicated uh, theory. A theory, in my mind, is only as good as its ability to make sense to all of us and for it to be useful. So um, that's just a way of positioning this um, with respect to the ideas and uh, theory uh, aspect of the discussion. Uh, in recent times, I've noticed I used to be involved in making audiovisual films and documentaries and uh, so I'm still interested in the production techniques and I've noticed in about the last four or five years that hardly any program that you watch, uh, uh, especially if it's got some aspect of interpreting our world, is, is without a drone footage. So the, the biggest and best new toy available these days for filmmakers is the drone. And so we get to see uh, the world from a, an unusual aspect, from just above um, our, where, our, where our own line of sight is. And we're not up in an aeroplane and we're not down at ground level where we are, but this drone footage, which is generally just above us, and we get to see all these unusual aspects. Maybe it's overused, but it's certainly at the moment quite um, interesting and innovative for all of us. Now, in the same way, I'm suggesting that when we live our lives and when we're involved in um, learning projects and in learning events such as this one, we live in the moment and we live in the now. And what we're trying to do in this um, presentation this morning is go into a drone and take a look both back in time uh, to early years forward to maybe uh, later years to take that drone and to look across the lifespan and also to take that drone and to move our concept of learning outside of a kind of an institutional concept uh, that is an ori originally formed in school and, and, and to see it as a core part of what it means to be human. So uh, that's what we're about. We're going up in a drone, we're going to take a look and hopefully we'll find some useful insights in the course of that. So the title of the uh, presentation is uh, Learning Across the Lifespan. And then there are three ideas that I want to um, use as a kind of a, a lens um, in looking at that uh, learning across the lifespan. And the three are self-direction, identity and participation. And um, uh, if you can just advance now, um, uh, Connor, we'll show you what the plan is uh, for this part of the session this morning. So the introduction I've just done, um, and we're going to talk about uh, stages of life. And uh, you can go into quite a lot of detail on these, and you can have as many stages as you want, and there are many uh, frameworks available. But I, I like a very simple one. It was proposed by an adult education writer called Nod Illeris, and I know that uh, Connor has provided some uh, links to works by Nod Illeris where you can follow up. But it's a really simple uh, four steps, four stages. Uh, that's childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and mature adulthood. So you can see those four in the in the plan this morning. We're going to talk about those uh, life stages, and then we're going to introduce then the the topics that are of interest to us. Uh, in between or, or, or in reference to these stages. So self-directedness is the first one, then something on identity, and then following that, something on participation. Uh, by the way, they're not separate uh, concepts. They all interconnect. Hopefully our drone will allow, allow us to see that um, and to see that, in fact, they're all probably aspects of what I call the desire to participate, which is the last one there, which I think is the overriding orientation of what it means to be human and what it means to learn. So if uh, Connor, if you just uh, uh, put the next slide up, I just wanted to provide a very simple working uh, definition of learning. Um, and I describe it as a collection of processes. So it's not one thing, it's a lot of processes that we have. And I said there are processes that involved interaction 
between the present and past experience. I mean, for example, I'm speaking now to you and you might say, well, Leo's saying something and I might be learning something, but I'm using words that you are familiar with from your past experiences. The whole context of Aintus is, is already a kind of a social context. So we can't pull away our past experience from our present. So there's an interaction happening between present and past all, all, all the time. And what we do sometimes then is that we, we kind of set aside aspects of it that and we do some work, maybe uh, internal work that's uh, uh, that we could describe in detail in uh, in a different session. But we do th that work so that it gives us new abilities for the future. So at a very simple level, you know, I, I learn a shortcut if I want to make a journey and I find, oh, that's a simple that, that that's a shortcut. That's one type of learning. But there's many, many learning processes. Some of them are quite primitive. We call those behaviorists. That's where we associate maybe uh, um a particular context, um, our experience in school, for example, and its association with either self-confidence or maybe with fear. That's that's a, a form of, of learning and uh, it can be quite primitive because it's, it's around uh, this notion of association and stimulus and response. And then there are more advanced forms of learning where we undertake learning projects in our life. So to learn to play the piano, maybe, or to uh, become a teacher or to become an adult educator. And these aren't just one simple learning act, but a whole set of project activities that we engage in to become more competent in the world. And some of these just happen to us and then others uh, we actually begin to direct. So uh, you can see in the top image there, the child is looking at the book, the child is engaged, it's probably been driven by its own curiosity at this point. Um, whereas maybe the person I'm suggesting in the other image uh, that's that's uh, it looks to me like um, she's teaching uh, it has been pursuing a um, a career change to become a teacher maybe from a different career in um, uh, earlier in their life so these are projects that we engage with but they're driven in different ways so a curiosity driven one from the child whereas you can see that the adult is more self-directed but the common aspect of this is that we're learning throughout our lives, that it never really stops. And um, when we say lifelong learning, we mean lifelong learning. That's as simple as that. Um, and I know there are other sometimes institutions or agencies that try to define lifelong learning in, in more narrow focused ways. Um, I think it really is what it says on the tin. It's learning from the beginning to the end of life. Um, if we take the next slide, I just present in a kind of a graphical way um, what we might say would be a, a typical um, uh, set of orientations uh, throughout our lifespan. So um, if looking at this uh, from uh, left to right, we see it in childhood that the orientation of the child is in, in the home um, and possibly in the school. Uh, probably there's a circle of friends and, and a, a relatively limited life view. And then in adolescence, I'm suggesting, and again, not everybody follows this. This isn't, you know, necessarily the pattern for everyone, but it is indicative of a typical progression in a person's life. Uh, they might have interest in college. It could be for their education college. They could be doing an, an apprenticeship. They could be engaged in a, tra a trade. So I mean it in its very broad sense. Um, finding friends, um, building your sense of self. Uh, these, these are aspects of what we're concerned with in adolescence. And we'll be saying a few uh, more comments about that in um, slides in, in a few moments. Then adulthood, where work, home and community are really probably the dominant areas of concern and through to mature adulthood. And we just suggest a slightly different orientation there for family, health and meaning. Now, again, you know, there's aspects of this that I'm going to just touch on because Nod Ilris would have written in detail about how adulthood and mature adulthood should be regarded as as separate uh, life stages in an I, I won't go into all all the detail of that but but in a nutshell uh, consider that in adulthood we are often very strategic about our learning 
um, we we need to get qualifications. Um, perhaps uh, we're concerned with building a home, with raising children, with uh, becoming economically uh, successful, with dealing with adversity, with uh, all of the trials and tribulations that life throws at you. So learning becomes quite strategic in adulthood. And what Illuris suggests is that for some people, not for everybody, and for some lucky people, we might say, that often when a lot of that trial and adversity is resolved, that there's a period of learning available that is uh, maybe more personal and that people can look at meaning in their life and they can pursue learning that is um, in response to their own personal curiosities. Notice, by the way, that you know when we show the image in the previous slide of the, the child, and I said, look at that child, is probably uh, learning through uh, its own impulse for curiosity. Um, so learning is just a really authentic, intrinsically motivated learning, like pursuing what you're interested in, that deep sense of I'll, I'm doing it for its own sake, that that's evident in childhood. But amazingly, also, it, it sometimes re-emerges in mature adulthood when we don't have to be strategic about our learning. Um, and, you know, I don't have to pass the driving test or something like that, which I might feel is something I need to do rather than I find intrinsically interested in. And I say to myself, actually, I really like to paint. And so I'm just going to do that in my mature adulthood. And notice also that none of these are defined um, certainly not defined by age and they're not defined by, as, as um, single point transitions. They are gradual transitions in most cases. The next slide then um, just gives us a simplification of that. Um, if, if you advance that, um, Connor, we have it here as child, adolescent, adult, mature adult. And that's the lifelong learning progression. And we're just going to advance to the next slide where I just want to introduce these three important ideas around lifelong learning. Um, and they're, they're relatively straightforward um, on the surface, but like anything else, there's many layers in there that you can actually begin to unpick. And the first uh, that I'll talk about will be self-directedness. And when we do the slides about the childhood, I'll introduce that idea, and then identity and then participation. So rather than seeing these as three separate ideas or concepts, I try to see that, for example, participation embraces self-directedness and the building of identity. And identity embraces both the others as well. So they are very interconnected, but for from our own thinking, it's very useful sometimes uh, to be able to separate those. Uh, in the next slide, um, I just wanted to introduce some of the aspects of um, learning in childhood and uh, this collection of pictures probably um, captures uh, as many aspects as as you'd want to kind of uh, you know convey we can see that we there's something very amazing happens uh, when we grow up it's it uh, could be the subject of an entire course or even a whole life of, of research and scholarship and it, many people do study that what is the most amazing thing is that like you know from newborn and even pre-born up to somebody who's standing in front of you having a conversation with you as an autonomous adult uh, active and successful in the world what has happened in the years in between to bring that about? And what are the processes that have allowed that to happen? And certainly the most uh, uh, significant uh, naming of those processes is that we describe those as learning processes. And you can see some of the um, characteristics of learning processes in childhood. We see uh, on the upper um, uh, left-hand side, as, as I see it anyway, the imitation we also see kind of uh, uh, important role of, of parents or more knowledgeable adults. We see literacy and the emergence of writing skills. We see absolute curiosity, finding yourself, uh, building your own kinesthetic. That's your abilities to move and manipulate objects, early reading, friends being, being emergence of understanding that people 
work together and collaborate. And then down at the bottom left hand side, the um, emergence of conceptual thinking, thinking around ideas and the shift from what we see the, the very young child there with the with the toy through to this abstract form of thinking that's represented in the shapes in the image. Next slide. Um, just kind of characterizes aspects of learning as we know it in childhood. It's an amazing process. I'm not going into it in detail today because we're focusing on adult learning. One of the most important aspects of it is the emergence of thinking and speech. And thinking and speech are social learning processes. So one of the big things we learn as human beings is to be together with other human beings. Um, and uh, when we then think about the um, notion in adulthood of participation, uh, you can see that it connects right back to our childhood, that we do not like being left out. We like to be with others. We like to collaborate. We engage in collective collaborative activities. Why? Because that is the way in which human beings have built their success through many generations of uh, what we call cultural reproduction. And so it's it's part of being human is to connect with others and to work and collaborate with others. But there is another aspect of childhood that's associated with learning and that's schooling. Um, and in the next slide, I just um, uh, emphasize that children's learning is guided and directed by others. And it's amazing how children accept this. So you can actually uh, go to any primary school that's operating as we speak and walk in there and the teacher is delivering a topic that has been determined by the teacher, maybe centrally by curriculum, but the children aren't saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in this topic today. They don't have that control over learning. It is guided by others. Now there is still just just in case um, you know uh, comments come in very uh, um, well uh, um, spotted people would come in and say okay but what about this guidance by curiosity these natural impulses for learning and say yes that they are absolutely still happening and extremely important play among children and all of that we could describe as guided um, by impulses rather than necessarily in a structured way. But it's still the case that there isn't that um, autonomy with the child, that the child can't sit back and say, I will learn how to socialize better. I will learn um, uh, specifically um, a particular skill. They may do that. They may even evidence it in some of the, their, their phrases, but it will always be supported um, by the environment, which is generally an adult environment. In contrast, on the next slide, adults tend to direct their own learning. They make their own decisions. We make our own decisions. We won't be here. Um, nobody, nobody's here this morning and, uh, except that you want to be here. And nobody will make you learn something that you do not wish to learn. Uh, so we are the controllers of our learning. And that creates the major difference between adult learning and children's learning. That in many ways, learning happens to children. And in many ways for adults, we make learning happen for us. And that that's the essential difference. Uh, so we'll say more about that as we go through the other aspects of the lifespan. But I'd like to move on now to the adolescent. And I use the word adolescent rather than the word teenager. Uh, because previously it was um, maybe adequate to say that the two are synonymous, that in teenage years, that there are characteristics uh, similar to the ones that we're about to discuss. But there's a lot of research, there's a lot of insights now that adolescence, which we call the transition zone between childhood and adulthood, that that period of time is getting longer and therefore it's extending into you know, from the teens into, you know, the early 20s and sometimes even into middle to late 20s. And it's not, it's, I mean, we're not talking here about a biological only change, but we're talking here about the kind of social and cognitive changes and that are mainly characterized in, in you know, in, in, in terms of the emergence of a stable identity. So that um, for adolescents, 
um, trying to find themselves might be the best description of that. And that there, there's a sense of uh, self is always tentative in adolescence because they're, they're trialing new identities. Um, in contrast, many adults already have a stable identity and they have a core stable self and they see the world from their perspective and they largely settle down. So this is the kind of perspective of adolescence that we see. In the next slide, I just have a few comments about it. Um, that it's uh, from about 13 uh, up to the emergence of the core identity. As I said, that can extend into the 20s now and that a lot of people are saying that it does, especially in terms of um, modern uh, um, perspectives in the, in, in the world that we know it. Um, it's 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 not a straightforward process for many people. It it is a bit troubled, and there's a lot of fluidity, and also that trouble is um, largely associated with modern life. Um, you know, if you go back even a hundred years ago, a lot of uh, people uh, did not have um, adolescence. It was a simple process of. Like if your father was a minor and your grandfather was a minor, then one day you didn't go to school, you went to the mine and you started working. Um, similarly for farmers, for people in service. So this was very tragic, um, but it was also very simple from the young person's perspective. They were, they were going to be whatever was predetermined. They did not have that choice. And now we introduce choice. And in the next slide, just a couple of comments that we make about what's happening for young people in the world today. Um, and they're uh, encouraged to think for themselves. Um, and they're encouraged to find a job that they really would like. What would you like to be? Um, and to follow your interests. Um, and uh, in the images there, deliberately picked these images of like happy people in work and uh, fulfilled people. And so in a way, imagine if you were uncertain, unsure about yourself, unsure about your abilities, um, uh, feeling uh, left out of the kind of social club that, that may be associated in your school, college, or in your uh, workplace setting. Um, and, and people are saying, oh, like, it's wonderful nowadays. You can be anything you want. See, that doesn't help as much as we might think. It, it kind of can, can, can actually uh, make it even more difficult for people because choice is kind of a deceptive quality. Um, you can only live one life. And so people telling you of all the other possibilities isn't as helpful as, as we might think. And people saying that uh, you can be anything. It's not actually the case that you can, that there are, you can cer certainly set goals and you should uh, set goals to become who you feel you should be. But just this other kind of layer of expectation can actually have a downside for young people and create a burden for them. And also um, there's another counterpoint to that, which is what I call the undue expectation of ease. Uh, you know, you see it all the time, like science is fun, making maths engaging. And, you know, I, 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 I think that's really important message, but sometimes a bit of honesty as well and saying, you know, well, if you want to learn science and, and you want to become good at maths, it's a skill that requires, a, you know, some su sustained engagement in problem solving, and that requires effort on your part as well. So in the next slide, um, just the other aspect of um, adolescence is, of course, the development of your identity and the tentativeness of identity or even the expression of identity and that can be prioritizing peer relationships partner finding um a term that like i i like it. It, it evolves literally from you know the attention span issue you know channel hopping and fluidity so it can be that like you know people won't won't are incapable of even watching uh, a few minutes of maybe a program on television without flicking around from channel to channel but that's not just expressed in that uh, behavior but that there's other uh, you know moving from um, uh, different 
um, expectations of what you'd like to do and and constantly trying new things and then abandoning them and then trying something else and then abandoning them and then trying something else again. Now we problematize that, uh, you know, adults problematize that, parents problematize that and see that as something that is a flaw in the young person. But actually it can be just as simple as people lit literally trying different things to find the one that makes most sense from their perspective so that channel hopping is characteristic and it's a very important one um and uh you know we need as educators to be able to deal with that expectations of ease as i say and and there's a kind of another side of it which is the last one they're called strange situations um and that is that like you know you're moving maybe from a home or a, you know a comfortable setting um, a supportive environment uh, often you find you know that young people moving from the home setting maybe to to the city and they find themselves having to make new friends and having to deal with the practicalities of life and that creates all the challenges associated with uh, strange situations so um this is, um, these are the characteristics. Just a few words now in the next slide um, on what we mean by identity. And I have it here as the experience, I'm using um, Eric Erickson's um, definition here. Uh, so we just take a look at it and maybe just, just consider it for a moment. The experience of being the same in different situations and contexts. So I mix, you know, my identity. Uh, now I, I I'm uh, you know in my sixties, so I can think back to my childhood and to various life stages. So I, I, I have an experience of being the same person. So I get that, and that's part of my identity. But the second part of it is also just as important, which is the experience that others also have the same uh, um, experience. That the, um, uh, so it's to know that you are a person but to know also that others are people as well. Um, so the two go hand in hand. Um, and a way of uh, trying to kind of come to terms with this, I think is exemplified in the poem, which is the next slide. Um, we probably remember this from um, our school days. I certainly do. And uh, this is the opening stanza of the poem by uh, William Butler Yeats. And um, I'll read it and I'll just uh, uh, comment on, on it. I, he says, um, I walked through the long schoolroom questioning, a kind old nun in a white hood replies. Oh, the children learn to cipher and to sing, to study reading books and histories, to cut and sew, be neat and everything in the best modern way. And then look at the last line. The children's eyes in momentary wonder stare upon a 60 year old smiling public man. So what is happening here is he's describing a situation where he's in a school, he's visiting a school. He, he, had a, he had a job to do that, actually, with the Irish government. He's visiting the school and the nun is telling him all the things that's going on. And he is thinking to himself, I wonder what I look like from the perspective of the children. And he says, what I look like is a smiling 60 year old public man he goes on in the poem then to say but i'm really much deeper than that and there's lots of stuff happening um uh, elsewhere in the poem but what he is doing there is he's given us the um uh insight into the mechanism whereby we frame our identity because if if in the if i think about myself um and i say but look i, I have a concept of myself that's my identity it's a self-concept how can i construct that because the minute i think about myself well i'm the one doing the thinking you know you can see the circular aspect of it so we can't directly construct um our identity we couldn't we, we we use a mechanism by saying i i see myself as i think others see me and so it's we construct our identity by how we think others see us so that's very important then when you talk about um, maybe people in social context, like when um, maybe a person goes back to education and they find themselves in a classroom. And, you know, the most uh, common scenario we find it when we ask somebody, um, Ed, how are you getting on? They say, oh, I, I'm not sure. I, I was really worried. And everyone else seems to be doing very well and I'm falling behind. And then you ask someone else and they say, oh, yeah, I'm not sure. Everyone else seems to be doing well and I'm falling behind. And everyone is thinking not directly about themselves, but about how they're perceived by the other people in the room. 
and 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 you know even sharing the insight and saying actually that's the mechanism of self-identity don't worry too much in the sense of it's it's how you think you are being regarded and also everybody else has that imposter syndrome and and you know a lot of uh, reassurance uh, to adults that they 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 can actually be quite successful so we might touch again on it and you might have questions about that later on but i want to keep moving um, from time perspective i want to just deal with the adulthood now when um, a core stable self has emerged and just in the next slide I just have um, put down here a few of the ideas from Malcolm Knowles. He was writing in the 40s and 50s in the United States about, oh, he called it um, andragogy and, um, you know, adult learning, the neglected ne ne species. But, but very much the ideas he put forward are still very relevant and they're very helpful to us as adult educators. So the first he says, self-concept. As a person matures, self-concept moves from one of being dependent personality towards being a self-directed human being. We've already seen that, that the, from the children to the adulthood, you begin to take control of your self-directed. That's very important. Experience, the next one, as a person matures, he or she accumulates a growing reservoir of experience that becomes an increasing resource for learning. So life experience is just so valuable in learning contexts. And when people are with you in any kind of learning situation, I think it's really important to draw on their own life experience. And it's amazing uh, how that can be done. And um, even in this um, seminar this morning, we're hoping in the group work uh, that we can draw on your experience in order to be able to uh, gain uh, some collective insights in this process. Readiness to learn as a person matures, readiness to learn becomes oriented to the tasks of social roles. So, you know, as I said, uh, often a person decides they want to trade because um, they want to maybe a particular accreditation uh, because they needed to get the job and they need the job to um, pay, the, pay the rent or the mortgage. And uh, so, so they, they have a use for learning and they're only going to learn what they deem to be useful and what they can see how it, how it works. And, and then at later stages, uh, the um, readiness to learn maybe become uh, oriented towards, I'm about to be a grandparent or something like that, you know? So so thinking of, we, we always want to know what our um, uh, purpose uh, for learning is. And as a person matures in number four there, um, we uh, uh, tend to um, uh, become quite focused in what we're doing now that again that can be deceptive because you might say well does that mean that um we are, are not prepared to put work in um you see we have to see the value of it um the example i'll give you is a kind of an academic one forgive me for that but i know that you would see it similarly applied in many different um adult learning contexts so for example in in teaching um uh, people uh, to become uh, researchers in education, you need uh, to uh, introduce uh, research methods and some research methods are really interesting, such as interviewing and, and qualitative methods, but some research methods involve working with statistics and mathematics and, and working with statistics and mathematics for some people is a learning challenge. So you have to make that connection to say you need to understand statistics because there's good concepts that can emerge from complex uh, surveys with um, you know multiple responses. Statistics help us understand that. So here's the reason why you're just going to have to do all that algebra and get back into your mathematical self. And so then when people know why, they're more prepared to do it. Um, and then number five there, the motivation to learn moves internal um and that again probably becomes more relevant in the mature adult um so in the next slide again it's just saying the same kind of stuff in another way adults tend to be self-motivated um adults uh, need to see the relevance and application um as as soon as you introduce the learning encounter they want to use their own experience and they want that experience acknowledged 
um, adults, uh, adults are more tolerant of ambiguity. And by the way, that the reason for that is because of the, the earlier one, the one above it, which is that because we have so much experience, we understand that, um, you know, the world isn't like it doesn't work like a clock. Um, there, there are insights such as the ones being shared in this uh, seminar, uh, which which are general, which can be applied in some and many uh, situations, but not all, because all human beings are different and things like that. So there is always ambiguity and adults are aware of power structures and workplace might be one one setting where power is is exercised, but also people maybe being forced or cajoled onto particular courses that they don't want to do or something like that. They know that they might have to do that for some kind of compliance process. So they're aware of that power structure. Um, but below a summary of like lots of research studies that said adults learn what they want to learn and what they perceive as useful to them. And I think that's a really important insight. Um, the mature adults then, um, Probably the last group is just this idea that for some they can move on to uh, to learn for the purposes of meaning um, and participation. And in the next slide, I just wanted to just recap again. We have child learning for development, adolescent learning for transition, um, adult learning for progression and mature adult learning for participation. Uh, next slide. Um, so this notion of being left out, we, we never want to be left out and we need to participate. And how does that act out? And particularly, I want to give you just the one example of how participation acts in later adult life and how troubling it can be. But there are many examples and hopefully in your um, discussions with, with others, you'll be able to uh, touch on those. So in the next slide, I have another poem by William Butler Yeats. Um, again, the first uh, few sentences of it, and that is sailing to Byzantium. Uh, that is no country for old men, the young and one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the macro crowded seas. So that is a poem about being left out. That is a poem about alienation. And the first line says it all. That is no country for old men. And in that, Yeats is talking about Ireland. So he's actually using that rather than this is no country. And in the image that you see there is actually, if you're ever in town, Mulligans of Pool Beg Street, um, that's behind the bar. It was behind the bar right back in the 1980s when I was in college. And um, I don't know, he's some local and, and he has that statement underneath computers, how are you? And so going back about 30 or 40 years, um, maybe 50 actually, um, you know, he, but he, he was there able to say, you know, I'm fine, I'm living my life. I don't need to be concerned with these new things are out now called computers. However, in the next slide, we will see that there is something happening that we now collectively could call the digital world. And um, and in the just advance the slide as well, you can see that alienation, as I call it, it's not the same as being completely excluded because there, there are things that can happen that I really don't care about. But alienation is being close but excluded. So it's like being uh, alongside someone in a conversation but not being permitted to join that conversation. And some social practices alienate those who lack basic um, uh, basic literacy. And we see this in digital skills. And these practices are not actually trivial. They're important because they deal with finance, travel, and family connection. So this digital world is... Uh, a kind of a world where people are excluded from participating. And in order to um, address that, they need to learn that participation. And that's a big learning challenge. So just in the last uh, slide there, you'll see learning changes through life, a little summary. Children want to capture the world. Young people want to construct their own identities. Adults pursue their life goals and mature adults seek richness and harmony. All of them want to participate. Um, and just moving to the final slide. Thank you very much and um, appreciate your attention.